then, uh, yeah, right there. Cool. I think I'm good. Hello, everybody. So I uh, usually don't make it all the way through this, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, small group, like, probably have time for questions and whatnot. 
So uh, who am I? My name is uh, John Nilap, work for Gotham Digital Science, do exploit uh, development, reverse engineering, security research, penetration testing, uh, a lot of code review. Uh, one of my specialties is working with like odd languages, you know, like uh, if you've ever had a uh, COBOL or a Fortran or a Pascal or any of that kind of code review, it's, it's part of my job to go deep diving on the languages not many people know, you know, get out of the Java, C Sharp kind of zone. Also big into the European demo scene, if anybody knows what that is. So I'm here to talk about uh, jump-oriented programming. Now, some people here might be familiar with return-oriented programming. And jump-oriented programming is a, uh, a variation on that that might become important later on in the future of exploit development. Right now, it's not really a viable thing in a lot of ways, but we're moving the technology in the direction where it might be. Uh, in the next few years, return-oriented programming attacks might become dead, more or less, due to protections built into uh, processors themselves and better operating systems development, all that stuff. Um, probably safe for the next, for the foreseeable future, but it's going to happen eventually. So uh, jump-oriented programming is a new way of doing things. Uh, it, it was described in 2010 by a group at North Carolina State University, but um, to my knowledge, there's never been a successful jump-oriented programming attack. And I'll show you why, because uh, jump-oriented programming is uh, magnitudes more complex uh, than return-oriented programming. All right. Uh, what we're going to talk about here is how we can start to uh, port return-oriented programming tools into jump-oriented programming tools and to start to expand what little support there is in uh, the current return area programming tools, and uh, to sort of also port what little support there is into other architectures, other situations where it doesn't exist. Uh, and also to sort of port the uh, state-of-the-art ROP generation tools to jump-oriented programming. So for those of you who are not familiar, Return oriented programming is a exploit technique that's used to bypass uh, uh, digital execution prevention. Basically, you know, uh, you can't execute code that you've injected into the program, you know, on the stack of the heap. Uh, you have to reuse code in the program using addresses and returning to them repeatedly to disable debt. Um, you know, code from the text session point back to an attacker control stack and then control flow is returned uh, by the ret instruction. Um, this bypasses the current protections and operating systems. Uh, the only thing uh, keeping attackers from doing this today is uh, good address-based layout randomization. Uh, but if you can break that, you can ROP, you can get out, and you can exploit stuff, right? Um, currently, return-oriented programming is sort of like the state of the art of exploit techniques, but in my opinion, it is eventually going to die. Um, Jump-oriented programming is different. Okay, we're going to uh, remove the dependency on stacks, heaps. Uh, we can use any kind of source of, of data. Um, instead of re repeatedly returning to the stack, uh, we're going to build a series of gadgets that are going to free us of that restriction. Uh, instead of repeatedly, uh, instead of going back to the stack, we're going to jump back into a series of dispatch gadgets um, and just get uh, rid of the stack. Why are we going to do this? Um, we won't always have stack control. We don't always have stack control now. Um, eventually, uh, there will be protections like Intel Shadow Stack, which will basically make it much, much harder to exploit things on the stack. Um, stack pivots are hard to find, much harder to find. Uh, with the uh, prevalence of 64-bit operating systems, become progressively impossible. Uh, things like uh, heap spray employ exploits are going to become progressively impossible. Um, if we're talking kernel space, uh, stack pivots are dangerous. Um, there might be important things that can crash an operating system uh, on the stack. And uh, when jump-oriented programming works, it has the potential to be far more convenient and stealthy for the attacker uh, than the current method. So let's talk about practically what that entails. So uh, here is sort of the model for a jump-oriented programming exploit as it was described in the original paper. 
Uh, what we have is a dispatch table, right? And then a gadget to iterate over that table. And that gadget can exist anywhere, right? And uh, that will iterate us over a series of sort of functional gadgets, right? So this could be anywhere on, uh, you know, attacker, attacker writable memory. Uh, it's not bound to the stack in any way. We can have completely stack free exploit using this technique. Uh, but it does add some dependencies that weren't there with return rate programming attacks. Uh, in a lot of ways, the functional gadgets are the same, but instead of returning, we're jumping back into our dispatch table. So we're going to do a thing, jump into our iterator, and our iterator is going to put us back into the dispatch table, right? So we really need uh, sort of three things, right? Functional gadgets with certain constraints on the registers, uh, a dispatch gadget, again, with different constraints on those registers. These can't be the same. Right, EBX, EDI, EDX. This has to be a dedicated thing to hold our program counter, although we could swap it around. It greatly increases uh, complexity. And we need a place to put our gadgets. Um, but in the case where a piece of software where we control uh, different kinds of memory than stack or the heap, then uh, this could be very convenient if we got to work, right? And the problem is that there isn't a good way to make it work right now. Uh, so let's talk about the various parts. Uh, first, we got the uh, dispatcher gadget, which is meant to uh, provide control flow. Uh, it needs to iterate over the program. But since uh, we're sort of defining our own iteration, uh, unlike with return-oriented programming, where we're always iterating over, over the uh, stack, you know, return, 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 uh, we can use different sort of data structures, right? Depending on what kind of iterator gadget we have, we could skip forward or backward in memory or use something more like a linked list. Right? As long as our like, software is smart enough to help us find this or willing to dedicate enough time to do it by hand, uh, then this could be extremely convenient, especially if we control like, the layout of memory in the program in a weird way. It could also be stealthy since our uh, gadgets could be stored non-contiguously non with each other. And we can also periodically, uh, periodically uh, change up how the gadgets are organized. Did I see a question back there? Okay, cool. Um, however, we do need to control the value of a register. Um, you know, the ideal simple way to do this is just to find an adder. Uh, any pattern will do. And uh, the original paper for this described various schemes involving linked less. Uh, the tool I developed, I'll show you, uh, has come up with various uh, complicated data structures that you could use. And again, you can switch it up mid-attack if it suits you. Uh, you could also pull your uh, instructions easily from two data sources or intermingle them or obscure them. Uh, you ultimately have a lot more control if you're willing to weather the complexity. All right? Functional gadgets are a little easier. Just has to do something and then jump back into our iterator slash dispatcher gadgets. All right? It's a little easier to deal with, easier to find using the automated tools. And um, if you're familiar with return-oriented programming, uh, the gadget flavors are the same, right? Uh, ultimately, what we want to do is set up a call of some sort to turn off DEP so that we can go about doing a much easier exploit, right? We don't want to be doing jump-oriented programming all day. What we want to do is do jump-oriented programming just long enough to turn off all the security inside the program and uh, make it a lot easier for us to exploit, right? Because this is... Uh, going to be involved getting this done. Um, uh, usually what that amounts to in Windows is setting up the arguments for virtual protect, which ultimately involves controlling all the registers. So a good like wish list for this kind of exploit is to be able to control all registers. And here are the current tools. And uh, I'm just going to say straight ahead, all of them are sort of lacking for this uh, in various ways. And I, I've been going about modifying them and making alternative versions, uh, add-ons, and whatnot uh, for a little while now in order to better facilitate this kind of attack. Uh, we got ROP, uh, ROP Gadget, uh, Monad Pi, uh, ROP C, ROPR, and Radar A2. Um, generally, what these things do is they uh, just list jump instructions or unconditional jumps in whatever architecture you're asking them to. Uh, analyze. However, 
uh, if you listen to what I said before about the various kinds of gadgets, uh, this could be a very daunting task to put together. And the other thing to keep in mind is that even large programs don't have that many unconditional jumps. Uh, so it's very important, I mean, compared to other instructions, right? So it's very important to be able to analyze and classify and rule out what you can and can't do. Um, it's not like return-oriented programming where nearly every gadget is sort of viable for some purpose. It's important to classify them. Um, none of the tools uh, help you do that. Uh, the other thing to consider is architecture support. Uh, this is like a, a very useful technique on a variety of architectures, including uh, some of the uh, embedded architectures like AVR, ARM, that kind of thing. And of course, those are the least supported things. So. Here is a list of architecture support, All right? And it kind of jumps off away once you get past x86. Um, it's kind of hard to find stuff. Uh, and even 64-bit is kind of not supported in general, uh, which kind of sucks. Again, we're coming to a 64-bit world. Uh, again, the support is basically you dump out a bunch of jump instructions and have fun putting out together all the pieces and figuring out all the various uh, dependencies. Uh, so, Radare uh, has very uh, generic route functionality. Uh, in a way, Radare is sort of the best of the bunch in the sense that you can just ask it for whatever you want, right? Uh, it has very good search functionality, so you can say, you know, this list of gadgets, can you find something that looks like this? Uh, but again, that throws a lot of the responsibility on the exploit developer and leaves you spending hours, days, weeks sifting through various uh, side effect laden gadgets. Uh, it's really not a good way to live. Um, again, just reiterating, it, all, all we're getting here is a list of gadgets and no way to, to vet them, which is really what we want. Uh, so. Here's uh, just an example of the kind of functionality provided by uh, Ropper. I'm sorry if it's hard to read, but again, it's just uh, dumping out some jump instructions. Something to keep in mind if you want to do jump-oriented programming is that uh, using larger binaries is to your advantage a great deal. Uh, this is not going to work out on a smaller binary. Um, when we uh, look at the tool I'm developing a little later, um, the test case I always use is um, uh, libobjective-c on macOS uh, because it's big and has a lot of stuff going on. Uh, running this against uh, even medium-sized programs, native code, uh, you're not going to find what you need. Uh, here's more wrapper on an even bigger binary still. In much larger binary, and we found some stuff. Um, this isn't due to flaws in programs, it's just like uh, lack of jump instructions in general, right? There's not that many conditional jumps uh, compared to other instructions and they don't always do what you need and a lot of them have side effects. Uh, let's look at another tool. This is Rob Gadget. Uh, again, you know, similar list of stuff. Uh, again, only can, uh, unconditional jumps, right? And uh, not a whole ton of them, and no information about what does a gadget do, how it's going to help you, and which of them goes in which part of the uh, jump forward programming equation, right? Uh, more Rob Gadget. And then Moda Pi also uh, supports uh, jump-oriented programming to some degree. Again, uh, similar kind of support. Um, doesn't really help you put together the pieces. Um, although it is nice, Mono.py, if you haven't used it, you should use it for your exploit development if you're working on x86. It doesn't support x64 at all, but uh, it's very convenient. It's a single library. It works with a couple of debuggers, and uh, it's generally wonderful. So, again, lack of gadgets, uh, they take a long time to run, and it's not actually helping us the way we want it to. Uh, so what we'd like to do is improve uh, the basic gadget search. What we want is more uh, opcodes. Um, we want a sort of vetting system for the opcodes, for the gadgets, and um, maybe find a way to use other types of jumps. Maybe there's other instructions that are equivalent to a jump. Maybe there's sequences of instructions that can be used in our jump-oriented programming attack. Uh, maybe we can use conditional jumps. Maybe we can use the call instruction, you know? Um, I found out when I went through these tools, many of them didn't even uh, say uh, uh, support indirect jumps, like a jump to a pointer and that kind of thing. So. Uh, that's something I'm going through and adding to all these tools. Um, and then here's a list of uh, improvements made to the tool. Uh, you know, 
uh, x64 registers, uh, bare support for indirect jumps, um, basically the same thing for Rock Gadget. Um, I would have loved to improve uh, Monet.py, but uh, it, the, the, the main thing I would improve is to add the x64 support, which is a massive year-long project. Um, so what I did do was uh, do a lot of work towards improving gadget comprehension. So what we want to be able to do is take those parts of the jump-oriented programming equation and classify the gadgets into those uh, roles and then make some kind of judgment about uh, how fit they are for the role and what kind of side effects they provide. Um, there's a couple of approaches to doing that, right? It's, uh, a, a lot of these tools give you some leeway as to how many instructions you read uh, ahead of the, like, because you, obviously you need your gadget to do something before the return, right? Uh, so it's sort of a calibration how much you put ahead. Again, we're not, like, reading into what kind of side effects it has. Um, none of us, none of them help you put together these sort of data structures. So the uh, basic way uh, they're doing this uh, is grepping over binaries, looking for certain uh, op codes or mnemonics. Um, what we're going to do is use a VM and then just actually run the gadgets and get some kind of real sense of what they actually do. And that'll give us a better sense of, of whether we can use them. Right? Uh, and then we're going to consider using conditional jumps. Um, there are far more conditional jumps in a binary than there are uh, non-conditional jumps, and none of the tools search for them, and there's good reason for that. Um, because uh, conditional jumps in XA6 are always relative, right? You're never going to jump to a register like we need, but we're still leaving out a, a very like, high potential for our jump-oriented programming to our control flow hijacking process. So one of my requirements for my own tool was to find a way to vet these uh, conditional jumps and see if there wasn't a way to force them into use so we could have greater surface area of attack. Because one of the, uh, when people talk about why this attack might be impossible, the reason it keeps coming up is that there's just not enough jumps in a program as opposed to returns. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're also going to see what we can do to force more functionality of our gadgets by messing with the registers and sort of fuzzing at them. All right, so uh, just to give you an example of how conditional jumps end up working on x86. Um, so if you see, we have this uh, jump not equal here, and it's just used to jump over a piece of code, right? Uh, it doesn't jump to any like arbitrarily uh, controllable place. But what if by some sequ sequence of events it did? Um, that's what we're kind of looking for. None of them trivially will, but if you follow the chain up far enough, some of them do, and they can be part of the attack. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, take these conditional jumps along with the regular ones and sort of fuzz at them by mutating registers and particularly uh, fuzzing the flags register, like trying all the iterations of the flags register to see if we can't get some kind of uh, return-oriented programming related functionality out of it. So uh, this is where we're going to see the uh, first screenshot from my tool, and uh, it's called Unidiff. And what it does is it uses the Unicorn emulator and uh, takes the output of a modified version of ROP Gadget and uh, runs various jump-oriented programming gadgets and um, gives some idea of their functionality. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of, of what that output means in a second, uh, but that's how some of the output looks. Um, okay, so what if we want to find a, uh, a dispatch table or our, our sort of... Uh, iterator gadget. Um, we need to find gadgets that uh, do a couple of things. Uh, modify a register and jump to a predictable location. Um, so my tool uh, finds gadgets that do that and rates them based on how user controllable they are and what kind of side effects they have. Uh, this is a step closer to having a fully automated tool that will put together the chain for you. And uh, it's going to say demo. We're not quite to the demo. So here's uh, what table traversal uh, looks like from a uh, control flow perspective, or the, this is really our requirements, right? We want a user controllable register, 
and a, uh, a mutatable value and a jump to our user controllable register. So uh, here's some uh, clearer output from my tool. And what this is giving you is, a, uh, is an address of gadget followed by uh, hex for the instructions and then uh, followed by a user controllable register um, and how much uh, it's been changed by mutation. So what this is telling you is that if you, if you put in your user controllable EEX, uh, you're going to get back the same number plus 70, right? And so what you can do is make your jump table, and it's got to be a data structure where each of your uh, malicious instructions is separated by 70 bytes. We'll see later. My tool finds a lot more options for that. You can even see below. Um, it found somewhere uh, they were negative 438 bytes apart from each other, right? Um, there's a lot of possibilities, but the fact that the tool vets them speeds up the process uh, tremendously. Uh, let's look at some functional gadgets. Uh, what we need to do here is a little easier, right? So we need to mutate a controlled register, but not the register that we just selected to be our program counter, right? Uh, we also want to just try not to destroy any other registers. Keep in mind that, like, the ultimate goal here is to set up all the registers for a virtual protect call. That would be the nicest thing. And then we want to jump back into the table. So we ultimately it would be great if we could control uh, some kind of register we like to. So here's an example of a, a compatible gadget that my tool found. Now, once you've identified some gadgets like my tool has, uh, now you need to find a way to put them together. And again, even with the help I just provided, it's a very long, uh, tedious, trouble fraught process. Uh, and so I went and sort of reverse engineered the various ROP tools to see how it was done for them. Um, generally, not super great, right? But everybody's working to get better and better stuff. Um, so uh, Coralin's tool, Mono.py uh, has a great algorithm for building ROP chains. Uh, and it does this by um, sort of uh, back, backwards tracing. It takes a uh, sort of a final ending point and tries to go over a pass in the program um, and work back to an input, right? Uh, the problem with that is that it's extremely uh, computationally expensive. It takes a long time to run, and even for like relatively trivial ROP payloads, it might not ever finish or might not give you a good answer. Um, so I decided not to go that way. Here's a uh, little snippet of the related code. Uh, the direction I'm going, and I don't have a demo for it right now, is I'm building an SMT solver to automatically uh, find sort of permutate and select combinations of these gadgets. Uh, one of the good things about my tool, as I'll show you in a moment, is that it shows you which gadgets don't provide side effects. And once you have that list of which gadgets don't provide side effects, you can start simplifying your processor model. If you know that you can get through your, your execution to a certain point without modifying this or that register, you can simplify, and that's very amenable to the SMT solver technique. Um, problem is you have to create a, uh, a model, and it's a time-consuming process. Um, so that's what we're working on now. Uh, there's, there's already someone, uh, his name's Kok Joe, he, I think he's in Europe. He's uh, already done a similar thing with Returnoid programming, and the uh, problem he's, he's going through, you know, with a much simpler, and we're calling Returnoid programming simple here, uh, with a much simpler process is that, again, it is very computationally expensive and might not ever finish in, like, real programs. So uh, that's really a struggle right now is to try and simplify this for the SMT solver so it does eventually finish satisfiable. Um, what else have we been doing to improve this? Um, uh, adding architecture support. So everything I've uh, just talked about, I am uh, adding support for uh, ARR, ARM, AVR, uh, ZOS, Spark, um, and uh, we're just going to go over some of the existing support for the uh, job-oriented techniques and the amenability of the technique to the various architectures. Um, 
generally of the like not at x86 uh, type architectures, ARM is the best supported but not su supported very well. Uh, none of the tools take into account any of the eccentricities of branching the ARM platform. If anyone's read any ARM assembly, you know that you can't just do certain things. You have to take thumb mode into account. Uh, uh, prefetch instructions and whatnot. Uh, it's not as simple as using a list of gadgets. Uh, again, the tool does not help you do that. I am working on a tool that will help you do that uh, so that you don't have to think so hard about exactly how the processor model works when you're putting it together your chain. Um, I would very much like to see AVR support. And uh, people often ask me why I'm so concerned with that. Uh, part of that is that I started my career in technology and 3D printing, spent a lot of time working on. Uh, on very improvised electronics, including a lot of Arduinos and uh, little, little prototyping boards. And uh, just this year at DEF CON, I gave a talk at, on hacking 3D printers, taking advantage of them to do you know, horrible, malicious things with 3D printers. And the topic of doing return-oriented programming in AVR kept coming up again and again and again. Part of the reason for that is that because AVR is a Harvard architecture, return-oriented programming is the only way to do exploitation. It is, it's protected, the, uh, the memory instructions are, memory and instructions are separated from each other uh, from the very start. Uh, so jump oriented programming is actually extremely amenable uh, to uh, AVR processors. Uh, there's not a single tool that supports this. And unfortunately, the dearth of quality uh, AVR simulators, or I should say, um, open source high quality AV AVR simulators has been an impediment. Um, in fact, we're just going to skip over this slide where I, I uh, cast some shade on the current AVR disassembler frameworks. We're just going to leave that by. <laughs> um, and then I did some Spark. And again, um, being, being closer to the, the risk architectures, um, it, uh, while not being a super practical field, it's an interesting one to add this functionality to. because. Uh, frankly, all these tools provide uh, Spark support, or a lot of them do Spark support for x86, so why not add it for John Point programming, which I did. So uh, here's an uh, example of a uh, Spark encoding, in, in case you ever wondered or were curious about doing that and putting that together. And um, here's an overview. overview. Um, uh, I found some points of improvement in common jump tools. Uh, added architecture support to several of them. I'm developing a tool to make the uh, technique a lot easier uh, and getting closer and closer every day to a point where it will be totally automated. Um, at the start of this project, I thought that this technique would be mostly impossible since it's, again, almost never seen in the wild, but uh, I found it's quite feasible from what I've seen uh, uh, in my own experiments. Uh, I, I plan on adding more architectures uh, integrating concolic execution techniques, uh, and then start providing known payloads for existing libraries. I think that's really the, uh, the, the end goal of this is to have some common payloads just like there exists for ROP so that people can play around with it. Um, so that's the end of the uh, presentation as it were, and now it's time for a little bit of a demo. All right. So here's some uh, sample output, but before we do that, we are going to take a look at a list of gadgets given out by Ropper. So one of the changes I made to, or Rop gadget I should say, one of the changes I made to it was to modify it so, oh geez, <laughs> can't type while I talk. There we go. Modify it so it would give non-conditional jumps as well. So uh, in this example here, I've limited just to uh, instructions uh, with a jump greater or equal in them somewhere, or a jump greater, I should say. Um, that was impossible before. This gives you a little bit of the idea of the input for my program is it takes a list of the, these these uh, gadgets, we have an address, uh, disassembly isn't used, and then we have uh, hex encoding of the instructions themselves. That's what my tool used. And then we're going to give a quick example of my tool running. 
And uh, this is it going over looking for uh, interesting uh, gadgets in a, in a list of gadgets. What it's doing is uh, going one by one and running them and then uh, sort of fuzzing them with inputs and trying to figure out what changes, what doesn't, and what can be controlled by the user. Um, so this is the final list of interesting gadgets and I'll, I'll help you take a look over it real quick. We'll sort of scoot up to the top. Or this is good enough. So we have an address, hex encoding to be used later if necessary, and then a rating, uh, one to three, with uh, one being the best. Um, two indicating uh, some kind of con controllable change and uh, uh, three uh, some kind of controllable change but in the negative direction. Um, so we can see we have one where we, uh, we control a uh, register. It should say which, it doesn't bug. Um, but it will also tell us which registers are invariant and haven't been changed by the process. Um, so in this case, we see that EEX is invariant, EDX is invariant, but ECX is uh, changed by negative 858. So if we needed a subtractor gadget, we could do it, but we have to move in, uh, in increments of 858, which isn't necessarily the most com uh, useful, but here we have uh, negative two, that's a little more useful. Uh, that's basically the gist of what it does. There's some other features, uh, this is still, uh, under development and being put together. All right, well, uh, that's, that's about the end of what I have to say. Um, uh, we've got plenty of time here, so I'm willing to take some questions if people are curious. Um, currently, I'm just using uh, Z3, but I should, yeah, definitely, right? Yeah, that's a great idea. That would Dave, definitely uh, save me some work putting together a processor model. Sure. Oh, <laughs> um, legally, uh, they're expensive. You have to buy them from IBM. <laughs> Well, not the emulator. So you can get an open source emulator. There's a Hercules emulator. What costs so much money is the like actual operating system, the, uh, how do you say, the, the disk image. Uh, if, if you look around, they are online, but uh, since I do this research publicly, I try not to pirate anything. <laughs>